If the name Wilton Felder sounds familiar to you, it should. World class, internationally known jazz saxophonist. Co-founder of the supergroup The Jazz Crusaders, which later became Just The Crusaders, and over the course of about 35 years, he even recorded nine solo albums. But what you might not know is that Wilton Felder had a double life as one of the most notable and in-demand bass players of the 1970s. A partial list of the artists that he recorded bass tracks for includes Joan Baez, The Hughes Corporation, Marvin Gaye, Jackson Brown, Tina Turner, Steely Dan, Seals and Crofts, Shuggy Otis, Billy Joel, and Joni Mitchell. Edith in the ring, the past over girl. Self taught, he started playing when he was gifted a Fender Telecaster bass by a club owner. He explains in a 2012 interview. Actually, a club owner gave me a bass and I learned to play the bass by myself. Joe was playing organ, and so he got tired of playing organ, and so I started playing bass. And I, I taught myself how to play the bass, and uh, I got uh, in the recording studio by a guy by the name of Ron Brown. I substituted for him once at, uh, for a Motown date, and um, put, um, a guy by the name of uh, Barrett, he um, called me back for some more sessions, and that's how I got into the recording industry. Uh, and. Bass. Wilton Felder had a singular style on the bass guitar, and I'm going to break down five of my favorite tracks to show you why he was so great. But first, it's important that you know that my list is not going to include this one. Yes, it's one of the greatest bass lines of all time, and Wilton Felder played it, but it's been discussed and dissected and replayed about a million times. I want to dig a little deeper into his style. This one was recorded right on the heels of the aforementioned I Want You Back, and like that track, we can hear a lot of James Jamerson DNA in this one. It's very active with very little space and it continually brings back a syncopated figure. This would later become a Wilton Felder trademark on the bass. To cop that Fender Telecaster tone on my bass, I'm plucking just in front of where the P bass pickup is, where that Tele pickup would be. The string is a little more flexible and sounds a little more elastic. Also, instead of digging in with your right hand, think light and precise when you're playing. This record has some ridiculous grooves, and his hookup with drummer Ed Green is just magical. Here you can really hear him using space to make this groove powerful. It's what we feel and not so much what's being played that really moves it. And yes, he is killing that syncopation. This is really a James Brown tune, and I love this because he's reinterpreting the groove. The original is up a half step, it's a bit faster, and it's also just a one bar groove. I don't want nobody. Grant Green's cover is slowed down, and the second bar now allows the groove to breathe. And dig that three note walk up that takes us back to the beginning perfectly. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Space is where it's at.
Probably his second most famous bass line, thanks to the Beastie Boys. How we gonna kick it? Gonna kick it roof down! Yeah, how you wanna kick it? Gonna kick it roof down! When you dig into his lines, you can really hear how much attention he paid to short notes, slurs, and obviously rhythm. The bass player is, is supposed to be, for me, is supplying the rhythm and the bottom end and listening to what's going on around you, not being the solo instrument. So uh, the groove that was going on, it was me to just keep it pumping like everybody else was doing. totally hear that he liked to incorporate flat threes, flat sevenths, and those upside sixteenth notes in his lines. This is a track I wasn't hip to until recently, and it's absolutely one of his best. Written and produced by Barry White before his solo career ever began, the last two minutes of this track is basically Wilton Felder carrying us off on a bed of bass goodness. There are two bass parts happening here, one low and one high. The high part is basically playing variations on a four bar melody. I can't think of a lot of R&B records in 1972 that had something like this going on, and it's one of the most beautiful things he ever recorded. When we talk about the great studio bassists of the 70s, a lot of the same names come up. Rainey, Sklar, Will Lee, but let's not forget about the saxophonists with the Crusaders who just happened to cut Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On when he wasn't on the road. I had a chance to meet Wilton Felder once in Japan in 1998 when I was playing there with Maynard Ferguson. I was really nervous to say something to him and in the end I ended up just yelling out to him, hey man, where's the bass? Which made him laugh. He said he had to leave it at home and I'm glad I got a chance to thank him for what he did for all of us. He's definitely not talked about enough and he left us with a lot of great music and great bass lines to listen to. Many thanks to Jake Feinberg and his amazing library of interviews with jazz greats, which I've linked in the description. Talk about oral history if you haven't heard it, check it out. <laughs>